Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another TPN webinar. Today, we're going to be discussing your property and giving your property a side hustle. Um, today, we're going to discuss specifically the advertising um, segment and whether or not your property might have a hidden um, ability to gain you some advertising income. In 2019, the total advertising spend in South Africa was around 30 billion rand. And as a landlord, you might be uh, sitting on the opportunity to get a little bit of that pie. Uh, with me today um, is Tulani Dumakude. He is the Group Head of um, Rights and Development at ProVantage Media Group. Welcome, Tulani. And also with me is William Follard, Director at Follard Mayor Morrison Incorporated. Um, he is also involved with the drafting of our commercial leaseback, which will form a part of uh, what we discussed today. We are releasing a new um, alternative income lease on advertising, which is being loaded into our TPN commercial lease pack. My name is Greg Mason. I'm the head of legal at TPN Credit Bureau, and welcome and hope you enjoy this, the session. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Please make sure you're logged into YouTube. Um, that will enable you to get involved with the chat. Please feel free to ask us questions. We will be having a short 15 minute Q&A session at the end of our formal part of um, the session today. If we are looking slightly blurry on the screen, please go to the bottom right hand corner of the screen, click on the cog icon and make sure you are selecting at least 720p in quality. Also at the end of the session in the Q&A, we will be posting feedback forms please make sure that you complete that feedback form. You will need that to earn your uh, unverified CBD point. And also it gives us uh, an idea of what you wanna hear from us in the future. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. So we're gonna be discussing um, advertising um, in general today. Um, as Head of Rights and Development at ProVantage Media Group, Talani is the expert in the field of uh, obtaining um, advertising space um, in commercial and industrial areas. Um, so. The viewers at home are going to be hearing a couple of terms that we, uh, they might not be used to hearing. Um, so one of them that we're going to be discussing in particular is out of home media. Tulani, can you maybe give us a little breakdown of what that actually entails? Thank you, Greg. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, as, as, as this Greg has already mentioned, we want to focus on the out of home media, which is really any our advertising that you consume when you're away from home. It can be billboards, it can be street furniture, it can be transit advertising, what you mm -hmm. see on taxis and buses. And, and right now, that's a segment that's growing very significantly um, throughout the world. Oh, brilliant. So Tulani's going to provide us with a little bit of context on the market. So Tulani's going to take us through a short um, presentation uh, where he's going to give us some excellent stats on advertising in South Africa and globally. And um, we're going to discuss from there. Thank you, Tulani. Thank you, Greg. Um, the presentation will focus on what is happening globally because if you, if you look at our industry and, and, and the trends, what is happening in South Africa is consistent with what is happening in other parts of the world. Um, even the South African companies, many of the companies in our space are part of the media associations in Europe or in the rest of Africa. So the trends show that. So in the last few years, um, the, 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 the data shows that there's been a consistent growth in, in the spend in the, in the industry. And that spend is also because of the growing number of structures on the ground and also because of the changing face of the industry. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen the growing conversion into digital structures. So that is what is largely fueling the growth. Mm. Um, digital structures have got more revenue. Uh, clients are more eager to pay for space on digital because there's less production rates mm -hmm. and it's quick. It can be changed in, in real time. And so that's happening globally. That is happening in South Africa. Even <coughs> though we may lag behind a little bit, but we are consistent with what we see worldwide. So um, just to touch on what you mean when, they, when you say digital, you see you know, the more let's say old school type of billboard where you have a person who has to climb on top and change an actual piece of uh, advertising that goes up there and stays. Whereas digital, you have your infrastructure which is placed, it's a, it's a board and then you can just load from a program whatever your um, ad's gonna be. It can be moving, it could be video, um, and also it could potentially have multiple different advertisers on that billboard at the same t um, rolling at the same time depending on your agreements that you have in place. Is that, is that, that exactly what, what it is, Greg? Um, just, just to add on what you've just said, mm. we in, in the industry we refer to static and digital. 
Digital is are the screens, really. It's, yeah. it's what you see on, on, the, on the highways, mm -hmm. the screens that will show animation. Um, but also that, what you put on those screens will be determined by, by what the regulation uh, of course, say. Yeah. On the highways, what is, what is very common because of the regulations is that even though it's digital, it will be screens that, are don't, that don't show full videos. Mm. They will show one advert, then change to the next. Mm. Um, the advantage is you can run 10 clients in that billboard because um, those are done uh, remotely in a studio. Okay. Whereas, as you said, on the traditional billboards, which are called static nowadays, mm -hmm. is that you will have to climb, go to the site, climb on the ladder to change that canvas on, the, on that billboard. Mm, um, they still have a place in the market as well. We can mm -hmm. completely discard them, but the, the trend is to go towards, towards digital because of the flexibility and the benefits of it as well. Great, thank you. Sorry, before the presentation ca continues, we've mm. just done a poll on the audience and we asked, are you investigating alternative income streams for your property? 46% um, of the audience said yes. 36% um, of the audience said that this is a totally new concept to them, so they're very interested and excited to hear what's happening. Excellent, thank you. So that's Nikki Kazergs, who's uh, sitting on the, the computer with us today. Uh, she's going to be interrupting with, um, with questions. Um, please feel free to ask in the chat, and uh, your question can be read out, and uh, we'll get an answer from you from the experts. Thank you, Tulani. Karen? Thank you, Greg. Um, I think we should rather move to South Africa, because uh, that's where the focus is right mm -hmm. now. If you look at the total advertising spent in South Africa, bulk of it goes to TV and video. Mm. And in our industry, because of digital advertising, we now are able to share that, that, that advertising spend. Mm. What used to traditionally go, go to TV, now it gets brought to, to our space as well, which is out of home media. Because a, a video that plays on TV can now be brought to us and we can play it at the airport, for instance. Mm. Um, so that's also bringing us a bit of growth. And if you look at the total, total uh, um, advertising spend in South Africa, in all formats, including TV, we are at more than, just more than 30 billion, as we mentioned earlier. Mm. And for, for our, the slice that we get out of that is about 10%, which works out to be 3 billion annually. Um, it's, it, it's growing. Um, we're very, very excited about the future. Uh, when, when we look at the trends, yes, COVID did disrupt a little bit, but there's been a reset now. The, um, the growth is coming back. Um, there's even new clients that are coming into the space who were not into out of home media before. Mm. Um, if you look at the sectors, for instance, um, size that would lead you to the airport, because the airport had to shut down during COVID, mm. that's where revenue was lost. But then if you look at other areas of convergence, like in the townships, like in the other areas, things didn't change there. Because if your property is on the way to Shawbright, Shawbright gained during, during COVID. Mm. There, was no, there was no slowdown. People still have to buy groceries. Of course. So it depends where you are. Not every area is affected the same way. Mm. And I think it's important then also for the viewers to realize that a lot of your advertising is um, determined by your mass audience. The number of views that your advert is going to get is what determines what your rental could be, what, um, you know over the costs and um, yeah it's making sure that if your property is as an example an industrial space which is looking onto a arterial road or freeway or as Tulani said the airport where you're going to get a lot of traffic at the large um, shopping centers those are the places where you're going to have the most eyes on your advertising and that's that's where your biggest um, market is going to be in terms of um, in terms of advertising. Correct we, we look at it we in the olden days we used to sell billboards Mm. Um, when we spoke to clients uh, who, who, who use our billboards for branding, mm. it was about the actual steel that's on the ground. Mm. Now, currently, when we go to clients, we sell an audience. Yes. So, when next to your property, um, imagine the number of people that drive past. Mm. That is the audience that we're looking at. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's an industrial area or it's in an affluent, um, modern environment. Because what happens, even if it's an industrial area, the, it's that arterial is connecting residential to commercial. Mm. So there's still an audience that drives mm. past there. You, you can be in an industrial area and you think you are in the, in the, in the, in the mid-LSM, yeah. only to realize that the, the audience, that's, that, the, that the traffic that goes past there is going to a very affluent uh, suburb. Mm. So that is what clients are looking for. Mm. It's, it's not the actual 
uh, location, it's the audience that's exposed to that location. Of course. And I think, William, this is maybe a good time to maybe dive into the difference between your zoning of your property. Um, industrial and commercial, there are opportunities for um, advertising, but as an example for if you're sitting in a residential property, what, what are the uh, restrictions on your, your advertising in that regard? Yeah, so it's probably something that Tulani could comment on more extensively, but <clears throat> the way most outdoor advertising bylaws work is they have areas of control mm. and they speak about certain landscapes. Um, and to start at the, at the areas of maximum control, those are areas where ideally you shouldn't see advertising. Mm. It's not to say it can't be there, but in principle, mun municipalities won't approve advertising in those areas. So it starts off the area of maximum control is what they call natural landscapes. So you aren't going to see commercial advertising in game reserves, nature mm. reserves. You aren't going to see it along scenic routes, scenic spots. So, you know, you might think, well, it'd be a great idea to put up a billboard overlooking God's window, mm. you know, in the Blida River Canyon. Well, you can't do that. Yeah. Because obviously that's an area of scenic beauty. Mm. And then, um, you know, lots of people that drive through these stretches of farmland, um, mm. you know, between destinations, <clears> and they would think, well, isn't that an ideal opportunity to put a large billboard up? Mm. Again, that's an area of maximum control for municipalities. So mm. in principle, there should be no uh, commercial advertising there. Mm. And then when you go to urban landscapes, you get areas of maximum control, um, partial control, mm -hmm. and minimal control. Now, areas of maximum control would in principle be your residential areas. Mm. And I'm sure a lot of the viewers will say, well, I've seen a number of billboards in yep. residential areas. Those are probably illegal. And just remember that illegal advertising is a massive problem. Mm. And then, of course, your zones of minimal control would be your industrial areas, for example, mm. and your commercial nodes where you expect to see commercial advertising. Mm. So we were having a discussion before um, we started our session today. Tulani was giving us some interesting stats on the number of illegal billboards you touched on from 2015. What was that uh, percentage? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a scary picture when you really, really look into it. And it's even scarier because these numbers came from the authorities. I mean, the numbers for, for Johannesburg came from the city of Johannesburg. Mm. Um, back, back around 2015, there were already over 70% of illegal billboards mm. on public land in Johannesburg. Um, it's gone worse. Um, it's due to a number of reasons. Uh, there's been a lot of new players into the market. Mm who feel like the processes are too long and costly. And, and, and also, also on the enforcement side, there, there's been a weakness in terms of the enforcement, and so pe people saw a gap, and they took it. Mm. Uh, but in contrast to that, you look at Tswane. Tswane will have a lot of billboards, but lots of them are legal okay. because of the way they manage the industry. They, even the council themselves, unfortunately, the, the councils are now competing with private landlords mm. because they're also They've always seen the potential revenue that they can get. So Tswane is like that. Tswane have realized the potential. They have a full department that is self-funded by the money that they generate from the industry. So mm. it's, it's really, really great. You, you go to other metros like Durban. Durban is in the middle. Um, because of it's in the coast, there's a lot of areas of maximum control. But even those areas now have been um, spoiled a little bit, but it's only because of one company. Largely, again, also in Durban, there's, there's, there's good compliance. I guess the, the best metro to look at mm -hmm. in terms of compliance, not, because, not in terms of the value of the industry, is, is, is Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, there, there, there's, there are huge potentials in Cape Town. Um, there are areas where you could get approvals. Mm -hmm. There are areas where landlord can still benefit and, and have their properties used for, for out of home advertising. Um, because because there's less there's less inventory in Cape Town, the demand is high, mm. uh, and also the rates that you get is, mm. is also very attractive as well. So the 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 enforcement part, the regulatory part, it's needed. Mm -hmm. the, the industry has to be regulated. We really we really really appreciate that. Even the leases that the the responsible media owners sign, they cover that. That even though I have a contract with you, but I will get all the paperwork first before I put up that structure in your land. Mm. So it's really, really important. But it can have a negative influence if it's not done properly as well. Mm. Uh, one distinction that can obviously be made is that 
if you have your own space and you want to advertise your own business and you're not getting external advertisers, that might be something different. So, I mean, we'll touch on municipal bylaws and how those bylaws are different for each municipality, which can regulate your size or your illumination of your, of your advertising. But in principle, advertising your own property on potentially a billboard or on a wall or something to that um, effect is not necessarily going to be an illegal uh, billboard. So don't go out there driving through and uh, seeing every billboard that you have on a, any property and start thinking that they're illegally advertising. But there are, there are potentials out there. Yes. Great, Tulonia. We talk about billboards a lot. Um, even, even on this slide, you can see the blue. The blue, <coughs> those are billboards. Out of home um, media is made up of different formats. As I said, we've got street furniture, we've got transit, we've got airport advertising, we've got mall advertising because it's also out of home. But the blue is what we're focusing on today because that, those are the roadside billboards. That where, that's where the bulk of the spend is. I mean, we, we spoke about three billion being what goes to out of home. The billboards t takes more than 40%. Um, so it's, it's almost one, 1 1.5 billion that only goes just for billboards. Mm -hmm. um, and also obviously the billboards, they vary in size. The, your value will come from billboards that are very close to major arterials, to highways. And also those, those billboards are mostly, mostly in, in areas that are industrial. Mm -hmm. Because to have a large billboard facing a highway, um, as William touched it, touched, touched it on earlier, it's got to be an area of minimum control. So a bulk of those billboards in blue are sitting in industrial properties mm -hmm. because they are areas of, money, of minimum, mi minimum control. Yes, malls as well, it being partial, they, there, is a, they, there is a fair share that's there. Um, it's only in maximum control where you won't find any that is approved legally. And then we, we're now going to touch a little bit more on, on, on the regulatory side and also how our partnerships are managed. We, we don't want to see landlords as, as they, they are on the other side. Mm. We, we, we are partners. They cannot be a billboard without a landowner, whether public or private. So really, even the way the contracts are structured, it, these are partnerships. But each partnership is, is structured differently depending on what those parties agree to. Um, in my department, uh, in rights and development, we, this is what we do every single day. We work with local government, we work with roads authorities, and we work with our partners, which is the, land, the, land, the landlords. In terms of local government, as I mentioned earlier, you, all the major metros in the country have got fairly similar bylaws. And those, those bylaws get reviewed from time to time. The, 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 the citizens are given a chance to, to, to participate in those processes. But when we attend these public participation processes, we don't find a lot of uh, of local people there is mostly the industry. So mm -hmm. when we see a change that's going to affect the industry negatively, we, we tend to be the only parties that are talking to the municipalities. But in some areas like in Johannesburg, you're finding residents associations, for instance, uh, coming to play a role and it's great uh, because they realize, especially in Joburg, they realize the, the potential income that they can get from their properties. Mm -hmm. So. In, in Johannesburg, um, I can name a couple of associations for residents that are really, really protecting their areas, um, and we really appreciate that. So, um, as I said, in, in metros, there's enough, uh, there's enough, there's enough, uh, there's enough um, bylaws in, in, in the space, but the opportunities are really in other areas, what we call secondary towns. There's no clutter in secondary towns. Even the bylaws in secondary towns are not as stringent as in, in the metros. So there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there that is not being captured at the moment. Um, right now, we are going a lot into those areas to, to speak to the partners in those areas and the municipalities, and, and it's, 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 it's been good. It's been going well. And then when we look at the models that are currently used. Just before we go into the models, so I think something that we can properly clarify here is that there's no national legislation that governs this. We need to look specifically down at the municipal level and I'm sure William from a from a legal side we can touch on this. So we pointed out that the regulations might be on sizes and the processes that go through so maybe you can tell us a little bit about the process that would be gone through to um, obtain. Maybe we can touch on a couple of the more common regulations that come through. Sure and I mean most of these bylaws share certain similarities. Mm. 
Um, municipalities like using precedents as much as lawyers do, so, that, so they mm. tend to follow a certain format. Um, look, the, the approval process actually is, is quite a complicated one. Yes, there is an application form, mm -hmm. but the devil lies in the detail that must accompany that application form. So you require mandates from the owner of the property, from the owner of the sign. You require site plans, uh, block plans, locality plans. You need engineer certificates. Um, there's probably a whole lot of other information that Talani can touch on. Then it also involves the payment of a prescribed free and the, a fee, yeah. and that happens up front. And these are significant fees. You know, when you look at billboards, you're talking about 40,000 Rand, 60,000 Rand, 80,000 Rand, depending on the type of structures mm. that you want to erect. Um, then there's also a public participation process. And what that entails really is that once you've made that application for approval, you need to advertise it. You need to advertise it in local newspapers. Um, you need to advertise a sign on the street front of the property where that advertising sign is going to be erected. In fact, you even need photographs which show date and timestamps um, from the date that you first displayed that advert to, to the last day, which is typically a period of, say, 21 days. So, um, yes, these are, the, 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 these are complicated processes. Yeah. and probably best left to the experts, like uh, to Lani's company, to be frank. Okay. Uh, I think we have a, a couple of questions coming through. Uh, Nikki. We have two questions from our audience. Um, we have a question on, uh, it says, when having a home office, are you allowed to have a billboard advertising on your own private property? Okay, so I think, uh, William, you can touch on this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah, it, it's, it's actually quite, quite a complicated question because um, Besides the municipal bylaws, you also have to look at things like um, homeowners association rules. Um, so I'm not sure we can give a blanket answer. But in principle, if you are operating a business from your home, you can display a small sign. Um, Tulani will be able to tell you what the size of that sign is. <laughs> but in principle, yes. And of course, if I'm an attorney, for example, and I have an office, of course I can, I can have the name of my firm you know, outside. Mm, um, yes. uh, Tulani, I hope I've got yeah. that correct. Yes, 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 to, 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 to William. Um, just to add on what William just, just mm. said now, when you have a home office, maybe you've rezoned um, that, that, yeah. that property uh, to mixed use, then you can, you can have a signage outside of that. Now, that's, there's different types. You can have your own sign, which is first party. There are not major restrictions there because you have to attract attention to your business. But if you want to go with that part advertising in that property, because it's in an area that is predominantly residential. So in third many party places, advertising, third party advertising being advertising someone else's business. Yes, yes. Not just someone else's business. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I get stuck with the terminology. No, no, of course. <laughs> thank you. Now, to go third party advertising, you then, you can't go be beyond 18 square meters because of the nature, because we also have to protect the environment as well. And also, if you're close to residential, you may not be digital because of the mm -hmm. illumination at night that goes, uh, that will then change the ambience. And also potentially causing distractions to drivers and uh, yes. leading to um, safety issues. Nikki, you have another question? Um, I have another question. It says, what is street fur furniture advertising and who are the main users of this medium? Tulani, I think good you good question for Tulani. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you guys. <laughs> the, what, what we refer to street furniture is, is the public infrastructure. It's litter bins, it's it's bus shelters, it's street name signs, it's, it's anything that is not for primarily for advertising. Okay. It's street furniture, but we use it also for advertising. So what municipalities are doing now, because they, are, they don't have re revenue, we come in and we provide the infrastructure. We come in and we put our own, own investment to build bus shelters. We then recover our investment through selling advertising space on those mediums and so that is street furniture. Um, also, what is also happening now is we're putting street furniture in the industrial complexes. We can go into an industrial park and look at the number of light poles there and put lamp pole advertising. So that is also street furniture. Okay, excellent. Um, Tulani, you were about to, uh, before I cut you off earlier, you were gonna go into the different models of uh, agreements that could be entered into between these parties yeah. and then carry on. Thank, thank you, Prak. In terms of the models, um, the, the industry has been changing. Uh, back in the day, like 20 years ago, landowners were comfortable with just taking rental every month. Um, it, it could be whatever agreed amount. Whether that structure had a client on or didn't have a client, 
landlords will just take that minimum rental. So those rentals can be fixed high because, as I said, they are paid even when there's no revenue on that structure. Um, then that, that changed a little bit as, as, as landowners are also changing how they manage their properties. We, we, got, we got to a, a model where we, yes, there is a small fixed per, um, amount and also in the, during the good times when there's good uh, revenue coming on, on that structure, we then share, we then share the profits as well. That's what we call a hybrid model. So even when there is no client on the, on the structure, there will be a fixed portion that you get. So that, that's where the partnerships then started, started to be popular um, among ourselves and also among the landowners. So this is quite a preferred model. If you look at the big parastatals, if you look at the big um, the property developers, this is largely the model that they go, they go with. In all these models, all the costs sti are, still, are still taken, not, not all, uh, just on the two models, on the hybrid and the, the, and the first one where it's fixed rental. The cost, they remain the responsibility of the media owner, which is us, including the cumbersome process that, uh, that William mentioned earlier. We take care of that process. We've been doing it for years. We have teams that do that in all the metros. So it will, that, that part will never be the, the, the headache of the, of the landowner. And, and also what is now also emerging now in the market um, with the large property, property organizations, they, they contribute to CAPEX. Um, we still run the operations, but they, they watch the books, they, they contribute to CAPEX. We take care of the application process, we build the structure, and then there you then share revenue, or share, share revenue 50-50 even though it's not really 50-50 because we have to recover our costs, mm -hmm. uh, management costs, there'll be a management fee every month. Um, so some of the, the, the companies who are going that route, uh, it's, it's not clear about the sustainability of it because the, 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 the industry has got its cycles. Um, when COVID showed us uh, how things can turn very, very quickly. So if you didn't leave the media owner to do the work, do the investment and pay you the rental. If you choose to be actively involved, then even during the bad times, you're gonna be together. You're gonna feel the pain with us. So those are the three models that are currently used right now. Excellent, and um, I think this would be a good time, William, to touch on um, our lease agreement that uh, we've drafted for the commercial lease back and the model that um, we've chosen to go with and the particular opportunities for landlords that are willing to put in the time to, to, to go through this. William, can you touch on that? No, absolutely. Um, let, let me start off by saying this, that whenever you draft a commercial agreement, you have to adopt a particular philosophy or model. And in drafting these agreements, we work closely with TPN. So we always go, obviously, for a landlord-centric model. Sorry, Tulani. <coughs> and, um, you know, uh, for this particular agreement, we went for a version of the hybrid model. Um, in our view, it's minimum risk minimum effort and a very acceptable return. Um, particularly if you, if you think of, of that complicated process I spoke about, um, the, the fees involved, not only the application fees but the capital expenditure on acquiring that billboard structure, erecting it. And then it's all very well having your approval and having a billboard but you need advertisers. And big media companies like Provantage have those relationships. They have relationships with all the advertising agencies, they, they probably have their own in-house advertising teams, I would think. And it's just so much easier to leave it in their hands. Um, so that's the model we've gone for. If there are, is a call um, from your subscribers, from your customers for other types of models, obviously we will produce those models as well. So for a, for a private landlord who's looking at going into this, um, there is obviously this long process, but you can, if you find an advertiser that wants to use your space and they're going to go through the process of the application, they can think of that as income that they wouldn't have had before. I think we were discussing this beforehand. Yes. So whilst it might take a while and there is costs involved for the tenant, um, if the landlord is willing to wait and is willing to go through and you get your leases signed and you, you have this waiting period um, there and it comes through and you get your approval, that's essentially money that you weren't going to have before. That is a... Yeah extra income over and above your normal rental that you would be able to get that you could then, you know, you can benefit from that. No, absolutely. And I think that philosophy is very important. Um, mm. This is a totally different beast. It's not a commercial lease mm. um, or an industrial lease or a retail lease for that matter. 
This is something that if it happens, it's revenue, as you said, that you wouldn't have had. Mm. And it's very important to have that mindset because we still have the occasional customer who would get upset that, well, they've entered into this agreement with the media company. Um, approval's been granted, the structure's been, a record, uh, been erected, and they're sitting without an advertiser. Mm. I think the lesson is be patient, mm. the money will come. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I just want to agree with that, with what William has just said. Um, yes, it, it can be frustrating when the structure is sitting in your property and there's no revenue. Um, if you look at the, at the, at the trends, even globally, a, a billboard cannot have a client 100% of the time. Of course. Um, because of, of how budget works with, 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 uh, with, with clients, because of the budgeting cycles, there's a lot of things that affect that. But media owners have got teams of people who are there every single day to sell the structure. And that, that's what they do. Um, that's a company asset that's sitting there. So the, the media, media owners will do, will do their best to make sure that as much as possible there's revenue that's being generated. And, and also what I've just picked up from, from, from landowners, they, they value transparency. Um, so you need to constantly um, be in communication with them. And what is also worked into the contracts now, especially with the hybrid model, is that because the landowner is getting a percentage, you want to give him a peace of mind that the amount you've paid him during the year is the true reflection of that percentage. So once a year, it's, it gets written into contracts that you submit audited statements. Um, or you can also do that during the year where you share some of the client contracts with them because they're entitled to that because they're getting a share of the revenue that's generated. Um, okay, so just let's, to give the, uh, an idea for the people at home, um, obviously your income that you can receive is very dependent on a, a whole load of variables. It could be the, the flow of people, um, there's, there's the location, there's multiple things. Let's say I am an industrial property on the N2 between Mschlange and Durban in KZN, and I am erecting a, an advertising board on, um, on the arterial freeway of the N2. What sort of, what sort of thing can I expect? You can obviously give a rough range. I'm not going to tie you down to a number. You know, as, as advertising income, where can, we, where can we be looking from a monthly, a monthly basis? Um, um, I don't want to paint to exaggerate. Of I also course. don't want to be too conservative. Of course. So I'll, I'll be in the middle. Um, okay. But it's going to be a fair, a, fair, a, fair, a fair rate. If you're in the end two, uh, you're doing 120 kilometers per hour. Mm. So there has to be a large billboard that's there. Of course. So if you talk about the static billboard, mm. uh, which is no animation, no videos, it's not digital, uh, it's you're looking at two faces. Because remember, we pay per face. Because one face can have one brand, another face have another brand. Mm. So that billboard is, will carry two clients. Mm. So you, as, as a rental there, you, you can't expect anything that is less than 30,000 rents per month, per month. Um, it, which, is, which will be passive income to the landlord. Mm. Something that wouldn't, tools, yes, wouldn't have had those Yes. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. So, but then when you take that structure and you make it digital, mm. now, one side can carry 10 clients, this side can, ter can, can carry an another 10 clients. So now your, the, the rental there for the landlords will, will, will double mm. or even triple. But if it's digital, two sides facing the highway, you're looking at close to 100,000 rent that goes to the, to the landlord. Brilliant, thank you. But then obviously with digital, there's a little bit more regulation on your illumination and these sort of things yes, as well. Yes, that, yes, that comes into it. So it will generally depend on a site visit and having a look at uh, seeing exactly what your particular plot of land could uh, incur. Yes, Nikki, we have a question. Um, I have two questions. They're not 100% directly related to what you're currently discussing. Um, I have a question from um, Bernice Lawrence. If a tenant wants to erect a standalone billboard to advertise his business, um, which is on a side road, the landlord has agreed that the tenant can do this. However, the side road belongs to the municipality. Is this, um, how would they get approval to go ahead with this? Well, 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 let me comment. I mean, firstly, of course, um, you look to your contract. So there's a contract between the landlord and the tenant, and as the viewer has quite correctly said, that probably requires that, that permission be obtained from the landlord, so that's the first step. But that, of course, isn't the end of the matter. You have to be able to do that legally. So in the example that you've given, I would think it's not simply a question of outdoor advertising approval, which would certainly be required, 
but you'd actually have to go and speak to the municipality for permission and probably have to enter into a lease with them. And I would think that's pretty difficult to learn. Especially if it's on municipal <coughs> land. It can yes. be done. It, it, it can be done, uh, but yes, it, it, it is not an easy process to follow. For It will still be first party. It will still be sort of a directional sign into that, into that business. So yes, it's doable. And if you look at the process, the process for a billboard for commercial advertising and the process for a structure that's going to be on council land, but for a local business, uh, there's a big, big difference. For, for a commercial business that is there, it, the process will be more simpler, but you can't just go and erect it. You have to go to the municipality. Now, bylaws differ from municipality to municipality, but yes, it's done, but with guidance from the municipality. Okay. Um, we then have another question, and I think I know what the answer will be. It <laughs> says, what is an acceptable size for a board on your property to show clients that the office and a business is being run from that premises? Um, they have an office from home at the moment. Um, they didn't mention the municipality, um, so I'm not so sure if that So let's assume precise. that it's on, it's on their own property and they're going to be advertising their own business that is being run from it. Let's also and just say it's a mixed zoned property. And let's say it's a standalone property. It's yes, not, it's not, not, within, a, not within a body corporate a complex, or a yeah, homeowners okay. association. Um, let's make what this would the size be? I'm, I'm not even sure. We're, we're making a lot of assumptions. Yes. But yeah. yes, we, we'll go with that. Um, there are no stipulated sizes. Uh, you've got to be reasonable. Um, also, it depends on the size of the building as well. You, obviously, it cannot be bigger than, than the building. Mm. Um, what, what, what usually is the guide is if you look at the suburban name signs, there are little signs that you'll see at the entrance to a suburb. Those will have a name of the suburb, and then we'll have an advertising structure just below it. Those are about um, half a meter in, 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 in length, and about probably about five and also about half a meter in, in, in height as well. So that's usually the guide. Uh, you can't be more than like two square meters when it's just a, a, a signage for that, for, that, for that business. But if you are in a business park, then you can go have a larger sign. The, the local authorities are always trying to keep the, 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 the spaces decluttered. Uh, so so, so that, that's the guide. For, a, for your own business, it's, it's really about being reasonable um, because you have to be seen. Yeah, Nikki, I, I think we have to be careful about that one because all the bylaws will be slightly different and some of them will have size restrictions. So I'm wary of giving a blanket response to that one. It's very important that if someone's going to do this, they should go and consult with the municipal bylaws for their specific area. Um, go and, you know, it's obviously there's different methods of obtaining copies of those. Sometimes they're available online. Sometimes you actually have to physically go to the municipality and get them. But it's, it's important that you consult your specific local bylaw and you go in and um, make sure that you comply with any regulations that are set out there. Um, I think this actually brings us towards the end of our formal portion of the section. So we're going to be going into um, our Q&A portion now if there's more questions. Our feedback forms will also be posted into the chat. Please uh, make sure that you complete those and return them to TPN. Um, Nikki, yes, we'll go into a bit more of the Q&A, provided we have questions to answer. I have quite a lot of questions. Uh, well, I've got a, one more question about a home office again. Um, <laughs> can we just define, and I'm not sure if I'm putting you on the spot, can I just define what a home office actually is? You know, with COVID and the pandemic, everybody was working from home at some point. Um, mm. Does that classify as a home office? So I think there's going to be a bit of a distinction of home office where you're running your business from home and working from home. So I think maybe William, we can touch on a, maybe a little bit more. Sure. There might um, be zoning issues and all sorts There of are so things. many issues and that's not really an outdoor advertising issue at all, mm -hmm. um, in, in, you know, in many ways. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't think I can really express an opinion on that. It's something that one would have to look into. As I say, it's not really an ad, outdoor advertising issue. Remember, outdoor advertising really is, and it comes from the Constitution. So the Constitution gives municipalities the power to regulate billboards and advertising in public spaces. Mm -hmm. And that's really the concept of outdoor advertising. Now, public space is very important, includes roads. Um, so 
When you think of outdoor advertising, you're thinking of advertising that is um, either in a public space or visible from a public space, yes. such mm. as a road. Mm. I think this is something of a side issue. I, I, I see it as important, and perhaps I'll look into it mm. after this webinar, and, and perhaps I can provide some feedback to the viewer um, through you, Nikki, if you don't mind. Perfect. Yeah, and again, we're looking at we're looking primarily at advertising other people's businesses here. Where you're advertising your own business, we've already sort of touched on. That you know brings with it a different different sets of um, regulations. So if you are if your property is mixed zoned or zoned for commercial use, but is in a residential area, and you are advertising your own business, that might be a very different um, a different situation. So um, yeah, work from home is obviously you can still be in your own residential property. If it's your business that's running from your home, it's where, let's say you have foot traffic from, uh, from clients, it's, it becomes very different um, in terms of regula regulations as well as zoning. And in fact, if I can pick up on something that you said, Greg, um, I think we tend to have a view of advertising as advertising goods and services. But of course, you must understand that these advertising structures can be used for other purposes. Um, so it can be used to publish upcoming events. Um, it could be used for party political purposes to send across political messages, um, cultural, religious messages. And so um, the use provisions in your site lease assume particular importance. And you'll see that in the TPN site lease, um, that use clause um, is actually quite extensive because you can contravene all sorts of laws and even commit crimes by advertising. So most advertising bylaws already prohibit things that are indecent, contrary mm. to good public morals. I think the, 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 the Johannesburg bylaws, for example, have a clause that you can't offend the public or any sector of the public. Mm -hmm. So you've got to take that into account straight away. And then just think of advertising goods and services. That has the potential to contravene copyright laws, mm -hmm. trademark laws, intellectual property laws. Um, there have been cases around the world where advertising billboards in particular have been used to defame people and, 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 and organizations. There's even the potential for an advert to constitute a crime. So we think of the hate crime bill, which will probably become part of our law. Yes. One can envisage a situation where you know you might publish an advertisement that constitutes a hate crime. So, you know, um, it, it's important to realize that it's not just advertising goods and services. There's, 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 there's a whole scope of additional um, revenue streams and sources of revenue. And also, TPN's obviously here to assist, um, assist the viewers with these sort of things. If you have questions about what particularly you want to put up on your advertising um, or on your own billboard, please feel free to contact us. Um, you can email legal at tpn.co.za and we'll, we'll get back to you and try and assist you as best we can. Any further questions? Um, yes, um, we've mentioned street furniture, digital boards, those um, the old fashioned canvas boards, um, which you still see everywhere. <laughs> um, can somebody's asking, can we paint um, your board? So obviously I would imagine your property or advertising your business on your boundary wall without permission. I mean, it's your wall, you own it. It's your property, sort of. It might be facing a road, but <laughs> is that something that's allowed? Um, part of that question says without permission. <laughs> okay. that's, the, that's the difficult part. Um, no, it has to be done with permission because remember, it's visible to the public. Uh, as William uh, mentioned, there's, there's so, there are so many laws that come into this space because you are communicating to the public. So the message you're putting up the, out there is, is regulated. Um, there's free speech, yes. Um, when, you, when you're doing that, in, in the city of Johannesburg, you can use your boundary wall as a billboard. It, it's allowed, but again, there is a, there is a process. You do need to get with the approval. Yes. yes with so when you look at the bylaws, it's, it's not just bylaws for billboards. It's bylaws for different formats. There are bylaws for freestanding billboards. There are regulations for wall-mounted structures on the actual building. And also you have boundary walls that can be used, yes. In fact, Nikki, let me say this, that um, you know, by definition, people in advertising are creative. And so these bylaws run to 70, 80, 90 pages in some cases. And a considerable portion of that bylaws deals with rules surrounding particular types of advertising. 
and, and particularly because advertisers are so creative. So, you know, quite apart from what uh, Tulani has spoken of, it regulates things like advertising on blimps, um, transit advertising, these trailers that you see going around. I mean, Cape Town, they even have rules for erecting containers, shipping containers, and superimposing advertisements on, on shipping containers. Because you can imagine, you can get such a scope, you know, if you, if, mm. you, if you put 50 containers together. So almost everything under the sun that you can think of is governed if it constitutes outdoor advertising in a public space. Thank you. Okay, I'm um, sorry, we mentioned transit um, signs. Would that include the little signs that are um, displayed in front of houses when building work may be going on, um, or for example, a property is on, um, is on the market um, on a Sunday afternoon um, in neighbourhoods, are those considered transit signs or...? They, they aren't transit signs, but the bylaws do, do deal with those signs. So for example, there'll be a section of the bylaws which typically will give an estate agent a permission to show a sign. Um, I think in some of the bylaws there are restrictions on the size, as you can, as you can imagine. Um, and what is the other question? Sorry, I forgot the first part of it. Um, uh, if you're looking at a construction company who's oh, building yes. a house oh, there, as an there, example. there are rules surrounding that mm. as well. So, um, again, it's permissible, certain types will require approval, um, but yes, I mean, I think that municipalities understand that these hoardings are erected and it obviously also provides an opportunity to advertise on the hoardings. Advertising on the hoardings requires permission, approval. Mm. Uh, allow me just to just add on what has been discussed. With, with, uh, with estate agents, for instance, they don't apply every Sunday when I have a house on shop, but they've re they are registered and they, they, they usually know what the limitations are and they, they all play according to those rules. Uh, and then when, it's, when you talk about transit signs, strictly speaking, transit signs are, are, tra are, are largely trailers, mm. uh, are, are mo mobile billboards, what you, what you may call it. Now, the main role with, with, with transit advertising, which is trailers, is that they should be mobile. Yes, they must be mobile, not but parked. But how many times do you see them parked? Mm. So mm. they are not transit And anymore. for weeks. <laughs> mm. Yes, so that's um, that's what transit transit sign is, okay. but in the in the in, in our industry we now refer to to commuter nodes where you've got billboards and taxi ranks or train stations mm. or airports. We now refer that to transit media because the audience is in transit. Right. Okay, we have one more question. Uh, um, it's from Tomcat Tom. He says, we are a re residential scheme with a corner facing an intersection in Somerset West. Who can we approach to determine if we qualify for placing billboards at this intersection? Is it to go to the municipality first to check what the laws are or uh, Tulani, I contact think you, a company? I think you're going to give them an answer here. The fact that they are... <laughs> The fact that they're zoned for residential. The, the, yes, the, mm. the fact that they are residential already limits them. They fall under the city of Cape Town. Years ago, the city of Cape Town used to allow advertising on, on mixed, on mixed use and properties. As long as there's some form of business in that property, they would allow it. They still do, but, but here's the catch. Where you put that advertising, that specific spot must be commercial part. Okay. But if it's just residential, it, no, it's, it's a no, you, you can't. Okay. So, so when you're talking about mixed use, are you talking about those old style flats? We, sorry, uh, we used to have a shop at the bottom and a flat on the top. Mm. Is that what yes. you're talking about? Yes. Um, Cape Town CBD, you see a lot of that. They're still there. Correct. There's the shops at the bottom, then it's, it, it's flats. They, there's billboards. The only billboards you find in Cape Town in, in CBD, that, that's where you find them. But now they're changing. If, if, if there's a shop in the bottom, you're going to put a billboard, then the billboard must also be in the bottom. Right. Thank you. Um, and, and Nikki, again, I think we must stress that a lot of the viewers are saying, well, what rubbish. We pass signs like this all the time. Remember, those signs are probably illegal. Yeah. Thank you, William. Thank you, Tulani. Um, so advertising is just the start of your property, potentially having a side hustle. Um, TPN with uh, Fuller May Rosen, we're going to be discussing some other options that might be available. We're looking at um, potentially cell phone towers and roof antennas. William, can you maybe provide some other examples that we might be looking at in the future? Well, that's the immediate example that comes to mind. Mm. Um, let me say this, that um, when we look at doing additional documents for the TPN lease pack, and we're always looking to, to, to do additional documents, we really are guided by what the customers want. Of course. So um, if you think about a year ago, we 
um, we published um, d disclaimer notices that you could um, post on the outside of, of your premises. And it's not something I would ever have thought of to include in the lease pack. But in fact, at the time, we had a number of inquiries from landlords who said, well, we want these notices. Mm -hmm. So we were very much guided by what the subscribers, by what the users want. Um, as Greg said, what is immediately in the pipeline is a different sort of site lease agreement. It's what we call a communication site lease agreement. And that, in a very similar vein to what we're discussing now, will give the tenant the right to erect um, communications equipment on the property. We're talking about antennas, cell phone towers, cell phone masts, mm. base stations, etc. And again, it will be a nice source of revenue for the landlord who's able to conclude those kind of agreements. Exactly. So you can always get in touch, legal at tpn.co.za. You can put it in your feedback form if you have any um, particular um, desire that you'd like to see from the commercial lease packs um, for, for alternative streams of revenue that you're interested in. Please feel free to let us know exactly what those are. We'll, we'll definitely look into them. Um, again, thank you for joining us today, Tulani. Thank you, William, for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Um, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg.